Let's start with nature's nitrogen. And first, uh, what is the impact of nitrogen for life? And that's what I've indicated here. It's, I just give you two building blocks of uh, very important molecules in organisms. It's the amino acids over there. I'm not allowed to go further than this, so sometimes I do things like this. Huh? That's <laughs> amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. Nucleotides, building blocks of DNA, also RNA. So really, let's say, almost the most important molecules in every living organism. I've put the arrows where the nitrogen is, and that's there are quite some, as you can see. So it really is a very important element. What is the origin of nitrogen? Well, to be simple, in fact, it, it is the air here. That's really the source of nitrogen that we have. But even plants are not able to use the nitrogen there from the air. Also, in their case, it first has to be transformed into ammonia, nitrogen fixation, I will call it, and then first plants can use it. If you think of nature's nitrogen, what processes are important in creating this? I've put here nitrogenase. Well, these are bacteria that have the enzyme nitrogenase. And this enzyme is responsible for the transition of nitrogen gas into ammonia. I said even plants cannot do this. Well, we, we can. We can do this, but that's what I've put on the top of the arrow. This will cost, and it does cost, a lot of energy. It's the most energy costing aspect of agriculture. This is the way we make artificial fertilizer. It's, uh, I would say, an almost unlimited source of nitrogen, if you think of air. And that's, just to illustrate this, I've put a balloon here. That's a, if you think of a balloon like this, I, I've intended to make a, something like five liters in it. It's probably a little bit less, because I didn't try it before, and I thought, well, I'd reach this size. That's probably really the limit I can put in. But, that's a, but if you think of it, uh, air like five liters, have you any idea? how much ammonium chloride, in that case, because that's what is the fertilizer, you could make of it. So imagine just five liters of air, that's almost nothing. Well, that's uh, what I used here. That's the amount you can make of it, which is so really, I would say, almost unlimited nitrogen that we have available, in this case for plants, but of course that also means for us, because that's what we eat, isn't it? That so nitrogen fixation. Bacteria with nitrogenase. One of the most efficient ways that uh, this ammonium is created is in systems like this. Here you see a legume plant. In this case, it's Medicago. And they have the ability to interact a symbiosis, to establish a symbiosis with bacteria, rhizobium bacteria. These are the two main players of this evening. Legume plants, rhizobium bacteria. Legumes, it's not, medicago is not something that you would eat a lot, but self, it's something that we use to study it. But other examples you know very well. It is, uh, let's say, pea, soybean, bean, clover, lupin. These are all examples of legumes. Very specific property of legumes is to form such nodules that you see here, and that's the site where the bacteria are hosted. And also it's the site which makes the process very, very efficient. Here you see a part of a section of a nodule. And what you see in green here, so that's fluorescent, these are the rhizobia, those here. These are cells that are completely packed with rhizobium bacteria that we changed so that they now have a fluorescent protein. But you can see it is enormous. These cells are completely packed with the bacteria. 
So why is this now such an optimal system? Why is nitrogen fixation in these nodules so efficient? We can look at it later, because here I have a Medicago, and here we have nodules. But part of the answer is the color that you see there. It's the red color of these nodules. This is a protein, which is very abundant in these nodules. It's a protein that is very similar to hemoglobin, myoglobin, so it is oxygen transport. Two reasons. The enzyme is extremely sensitive to oxygen. It has killed the enzyme. But it needs, the bacterium needs oxygen to create energy. So this is a fantastic system in which you have a low concentration of oxygen. That's how the enzyme is protected. But also you have a very efficient system to deliver the oxygen, but at a very low concentration. Well, that makes these nodules uh, ideal to be efficient. That's one good thing of these nodules. Another advantage. Here you have a fantastic efficient delivery system towards the plant. The bacteria makes ammonium and it delivers this in a very efficient manner. Efficient means in this case it isn't spoiled. If you give artificial fertilizer, not everything is used by the plant. It's the way you do it, but it can be lost and it can pollute the environment. So that are, I think, reasons why such a system is really very attractive. The cells that we see here, I think I'll switch now to the topic that I was dealing with for this evening. And that's uh, how can they tame it, because I, what you see here, it's in fact, and I go back to this picture down, these cells are really extremely filled with rhizobia. It's not a little bit. If we would have so many bacteria in our cells, well, these cells will be killed. That in fact is also true for the plant, if the bacteria would just be there. The plant will not survive. I show you here one cell that you see there, but it's not just the magnification, it's a completely different picture that I show you. There, the bacterium is made visible. Here, you don't see the bacteria, but what you see here is a membrane, a membrane of the host, of the plant, that surrounds the bacteria. So each bacterium, in this cell is surrounded by a membrane of the host. That is how it is, uh, in this case, tamed. Because what is the advantage? I've made a schedule of this, of just single bacterium here. It fixes nitrogen, nitrogen into ammonia. But it's surrounded by a membrane of the host. Well, that implies that almost everything that is present in the cell of the plant is not available for the bacterium, because it cannot pass this membrane. It can only pass the membrane if the plant puts specific channel in the membrane. That's what I indicated with the blue arrow, for example. That means that the compound that can pass this channel, that's what the bacterium will get. Other compounds like this here, not available. If the membrane would be absent, not only it would eat everything, but it's really everything. The mitochondria, the nuclei, everything will be eaten by the bacteria and the cell will be dead. This is, let's say, an or well, you could say this is an absolute necessity of the plant to protect itself, but also to put full control on whether the bacteria are allowed to be there and what it will provide to these bacteria. It also uh, controls what it will get back. 
because this ammonia will also not pass the membrane. It really needs a specific channel. So as long as the plant is putting these there, it will get what it wants and it also can give what it likes to give to the bacteria. But it's really the plant is in control on this. It is even worse for these bacteria. Uh, because what the plant does, it's not only giving compounds that the bacteria can use to eat, it even has uh, antimicrobial compounds. Compounds, peptides, that at a high concentration would even kill the bacteria. The concentration that it gives to the bacteria is low, but the bacteria in the cells, like these that are doing the job, that's the end of their life. They cannot divide anymore. That's how they're put under control of the plant in this case. So is it symbiosis? Well, you could also say they are nice slaves and do the job for the plant. Huh? That's in this case. But also for us, huh? well, this is what we like to eat as well. Okay, that's a, a first step. I was there with the nodule, cells that are infected. But it means uh, the bacteria have to enter the plant. It's not that they're always there. This is a specific organ. It's sitting there having cells that are fully infected. But if it's not needed, it's lost. Always plants have to be infected again and again by these bacteria. So how do they enter? Well, here you see an example. And on the right here, what you see is a root hair that's in red. And in green, fluorescent, that's the bacteria. What you see here is in fact only the bacteria, but it is a tube that is made by the plant. Around these bacteria is a thick cell wall and a membrane. So it's really the bacteria are guided inside and are never just swimming around in the cell. No, the plant is controlling what it does. And on this picture you see is a part of a root. This is such a tube and it grows to the young nodule and there the bacteria are allowed to go in. I will show you how this starts. It is a root hair again and a single bacterium is sufficient to start the process. But you see it's very tightly regulated. This is this bacterium. It is sitting here, recognized by the plant, and as you can see, the tip of the root hair starts to bend. It knows where the bacteria is, and it bends towards this one. It forms a curl. And in the next picture, you see a root hair from the top, which has formed a nice curl, and it has captured the bacteria. The bacteria, so now we look at the top of her root hair, you see this is the curl, and here we have a very small colony of bacteria captured in the curl. So again, a control of the plant. It starts with a single bacterium, it recognizes this, that's one, it curls around it, then the tube is formed. So that starts and that's what we see here. This is a curl, the colony that is there, and this here is the, are the bacteria that are in the tube. Okay, that's, um, I say the plant recognizes the bacterium. That's this stage. Only if it is the right bacterium, it will do this. Then it starts to bend around it. Even it's uh, more fantastic. If there is ammonium in the soil, the plant doesn't need it. It will do nothing. So even in that case, so if you have nitrogen in the soil, ammonium, and it's sufficient for the growth, the plant says, okay, this is the right bacterium, but I don't need it. I don't start this process, says even. So that's what it can do. It also means if it's here, I say it recognizes whether it's the right bacterium. This is the one I want to allow 
to get into me. It means there are signals. It means the rhizobium has to make a signal which is specific and a signal that is recognized by the plant. The signal is named knot factor, nodulation factor, <laughs> inducing the formation of nodules. The receptor, that's a protein from the plant, has to recognize this is the right key. I allow this bacterium to go in. That's what the system has to be, and that's what it is. This is the signal molecule, and it's not the signal molecule. This is one example. It's a small guiding backbone, four, five subunits. It's always a lipid at that tail, but everywhere where I put now a red arrow, this is something that can be different. There can be a sulfate at this position. This plant here, Medicago, it likes it. It wants it to be there. If the sulfate is not at that position, nothing happens. If you take P, if the sulfate is there, P does nothing. It wants to have uh, an acetate group at that position. There can be sugars at this position. And so that is how great specificity is created. <coughs> Maybe for those who are a little bit familiar with uh, microbiology, a guitin backbone is something pretty strange for a bacterium. Fungi, that's where you expect it. Insects, uh, but not bacteria. So it is a strange molecule, but it works. It works fantastic. Uh, this is a molecule that is extremely active. This molecule is by itself sufficient to induce the formation of nodules. So in the absence of bacteria, <laughs> if you give this molecule to a plant, it will make nodules, but of course without bacteria. Think of concentrations that are used, it's extremely low. It's 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 10 molar, that is sufficient. If you think of 10 to the minus 8 molar, that means in the volume of a bacterium, it's a single molecule. So if you have the volume of 100 bacteria and one molecule, that triggers the formation of a nodule. So this molecule has to be recognized by the plant. That's what I indicated there, and the blue ball there, that's the, uh, the knot factor. It's recognized. We are here at the outside of the cell. It is recognized by the receptor, and the signal is now transmitted. And I indicate it reaches by a few proteins, the nucleus, and there it changes gene expression. Gene expression leading to proteins that are required for, that's what I indicate here, required for the infection and also for the nodulation process. So we have signaling and then we have a process. Here we have something very striking. Striking in the sense, these proteins here, the one I indicate in red, like the receptor, are only involved in the symbiotic interaction. They are absolutely required to make nodules. So those genes are cloned, we know what they are. Absence, no response. But the striking thing is, I indicated here, they are also involved in the interaction with mycorrhizal fungi. So no bacteria, but mycorrhizae. Why is that? Striking. Well, this is a piece of root. These are the hyphae of the mycorrhizae. The mycorrhizae fungi enter the plant, and in this way, they are able to facilitate the uptake of nutrients like phosphate. So that's all different. What is striking 
is that this interaction, the mycorrhizal interaction, is very ancient and it is maintained in almost every plant currently. Legumes, a very specific family. But now we have genes that occur in almost any plant and they are used by rhizobium. They have been recruited. To make it even shorter, these mycorrhizae make also molecules that are very similar to knot factors. So this is what rhizobium has learned. Make a molecule that resembles a fungus and copy it and use it. Because there is another similarity and that's what you see here. This is now inside the plant, the hyphae. But this is inside the cells, very branched structures. They are named arbuscles. They are there to release the nutrients and also to take up the carbon. What is similar to rhizobium? Also this is surrounded by a membrane of the host. So the structure that you see inside the cell is also surrounded by a membrane of the host for the same reason. No symbiosis without such a membrane. Here you see it in fluorescence. In fact, it's the same. Hyphae between the cells, this here are the arbuscles. We know also now uh, what mechanism is used to create this membrane around the structures. It's a very specific membrane targeting process. Yes, so it's a mechanism by which membranes are to brought to the same place. The fungus can infect, this is in between the cells, but the arbuscles are gone. Exactly the same mechanism is also used by rhizobium to create the membranes around it. So not only the signaling has been learned from mycorrhizae, also how to make a membrane around the arbuscles has been learned from this very ancient interaction. And that's what you see here, this is a nodule. Here bacteria are released around with a membrane. Here we have infection threats, but bacteria are not released. Ancient interaction occurring in almost any plant, mycorrhizae, rhizobium, very specific. So you can now wonder, how is it possible that legumes are so specific that only legumes make nodules and interact with rhizobia? Why doesn't it occur in other plants? Is that useful? Well, um, here you see a picture of a sketch which was made by Beiring. He was a professor in Wageningen, but also in Delft. He is the one, more than 100 years ago, who discovers that the nodules have rhizobia and that the rhizobia are responsible for the nitrogen fixation. Well, that's at the moment that we know how useful they are and what they do. In fact, the knowledge that legumes are important is very ancient. Every agriculture that arises, it's China, America, Middle East, they know that legumes are important. Soybean, bean, lentil. It's always within agriculture that it's used. When this is discovered, what you see uh, almost immediately in the literature, can't we transfer this ability to form nodules to non-legumes? Can we transfer it to crops so they become independent from fertilizer? artificial fertilizer and make use of nature's nitrogen. Well, that's of course is a major challenge and it's a, a challenge and the answer is uh, for sure it must be possible. The tree that you see over there, that's a non-legume. It's a tropical tree, it's a pioneer, it's named Parasponia, it grows on hills of volcanoes when everything is gone and it establishes a rhizobium nodulation interaction. It can fix. This is, has evolved independently from legumes and what we in the lab try to do, 
try to understand this far more recent interaction and see whether that knowledge ultimately then can be used to transfer this nodulation ability to non-legumes. And that's where I like to stop. Thank you. <laughs>